Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, this is the Trump Presidential Library. Get it? Um, I know. I know. It's a tough. It's a tough panel, um, but I think I think you'll find it amusing, if not uh, enlightening. You'll probably find it enlightening. Um, so I'm R. Sikoriak. I have a new book out called The Unquotable Trump, and Shannon Wheeler here has a book called Shht, My President Says. Or, or Shastrix. There you go. Um, which is a much better title because his name isn't so big on the cover. Anyway, um, so we were trying to grapple with this crazy reality we're in, and um, I'll show you a little bit about my, about my work and where I'm coming from with what I did, and Shan will start with his, and then we'll open it up for questions. I'm sure everybody's got a lot of questions. I doubt we have any answers, but I'm sure there's a lot of questions. So please welcome the author of Asterix, My President Says, Shannon Wheeler. Uh, thank you. Is this this is a good volume level and this is about right? Solid? Okay, sweet. There. All right. Well, uh, my name is Shannon Wheeler. I did the smaller book um, <laughs> for small hands. And I've known for Too Much Coffee Man, which I did through the 90s, and I still do it when I feel like it. Started doing cartoons for The Onion at one point and did a bunch for them. Clean cartoons until I was talking to my editor because I wanted to do a fart cartoon. He's like, oh yeah, do anything you want. I said, anything? He's like, yeah, anything. So then I started doing dirty cartoons for the uh, Onion, which was like opening a floodgate because um, I'd never done dirty cartoons before. And then The New Yorker, I started about six or seven years ago doing cartoons for them. And this Trump cartoon book started because I was putting together another book of New Yorker rejection cartoons. And I was complaining to my friend that I was just sick of looking at my own stuff. And, oh, the Bible. I did the Bible, too. I forgot about that. Um, anyways. <laughs> and an opera. That, too. Um, and, and he just looked at me, oh, just illustrate Trump's tweets. And I was like, oh, my god, that's great. And I think he said it to shut me up, <laughs> just to get me to stop complaining. But I. I took it and ran with it. And it was a lot, very much like drawing in high school, where I would just like sit and watch teachers I didn't like and just doodle. And it, was, it had that same catharsis of, I'm going to get through this for years. So what I'm going to do is show a little bit about the history of satirical cartooning and satire in magazines. And that'll segue into some of the Trump stuff. And really, satirical cartooning is a pretty recent thing. Um, I mean, cartooning is recent, and satirical cartooning is even even newer than that. And I would say, you know, maybe. Oh, if I, I need help pressing the button. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Look at that. I can press a button. So uh, Pompeii, I would say, is some of our early satirical cartooning, and it was well preserved up on as graffiti. And so it was nice that when the volcano got offended by some of it and preserved it all nicely. And there's a lot of it, and a lot of it's really dirty. And some of them have to do with defecation or um, making women moan, like Artemis made, uh, makes the women moan. And this one is, I think, I, I think this one is Artemis got me pregnant which I think I count that as a political cartoon. <laughs> and so graffiti, and I'm sure in publications through the years, have used cartoons making fun of authority figures. And where it really took off is in Punch Magazine, and um, Puck, Puck Magazine, I'm sorry, um, and The Yellow Kid, which is really interesting in that it was talking about a lot of the same issues that we're facing now, where you've got urban sprawl and poverty. And um, the yellow kid is the character sort of towards the front with a little yellow smock on. And he's kind of a Alfred E. Newman, what me worry character. But he'll have a little statement that's commentary that would appear in a shirt. And I always thought it was kind of a vaguely racist, you know, yellow kid kind of commentary. But it turns out he's an Irish kid because they're poor Irish. So I was like, oh, it's still racist, but now it's kind of an OK racism. <laughs> I'm OK with Irish racism. But, um, 
<laughs> and they would shave him bald because he would get lice, and that was a, a lot of kids were shaved to get rid of the lice, which is another little fact I didn't know. But the cartoons were so popular that they were taking over the newspapers, and so they would run these yellow kid cartoons and other cartoons bigger and bigger, and the articles had to get smaller and smaller. And so the headlines became more and more attention-grabbing. And that's why it started to be called yellow journalism, is because of the yellow kid and the shift in journalism, um, as the reduction in journalism because of the cartoons pushing them out. Um, which, you know, the, the headlines being that way, it's like an early form of clickbait. So Puck Magazine, lots of political cartoons and commentary on that. And they were an early purveyor of color cartoons, and they would do it by uh, separating out into a four color process and they would hand hand work all these pieces. And here's one of the early cartoonists working on a Cintiq, which is actually a stone tablet. Um, and he would look at the, the cartoon in black and white and then he would work for each color, carve into the stone, um, and then they would ink it and they would do their press and all that to make the color cartoon. So it was laborious, but uh, pretty, it was a neat little process. And the, the uh, political cartoons, a lot of anti-war stuff was coming out. And World War I and World War II saw a lot of people talking about uh, this is death buying a baby from a gorilla of war. And this is probably one of the more tame cartoons. So as you see sort of the similar ilk of cartoons coming out now, you, they really have their roots going back to this visual imagery of this time. And the emotional reaction to war was just very palpable. People really were responding to it. And so when the wars ended and we moved into the 50s, there was an idealism that happened where people were wanting to escape the horrors of World War I and World War II. And so Life magazine and, and the bucolic nature of the 50s, people were really emphasizing. So of course, when cartoons and cartoonists were hitting this period, they appropriately mocked it as much as they mocked anything else. And Mad Magazine was one of the early purveyors of, of uh, mocking the, the powers that be. And then moving into the 70s, hitting the politicians and making fun of Nixon and anybody else that they could and would make fun of. And they, Mad Magazine just had no limits, and I think they really trained a whole another nation, uh, a whole other generation of cartoonists. Um, that's one of my favorite covers of Mad Magazine. The underground cartoons at the time, they did some political stuff, but they were mostly focused on social satire and talking about the social mores, I would say. I mean, there's definitely exceptions and overlaps. And as you move into Mad Magazine and the lack of limits, um, so sort of notice like how, like, <laughs> um, it, you see this in just like the, the visceral reaction that you have, it's like, we're kind of a more uptight culture all of a sudden again, but National Lampoon is one of the people that pushed a lot of these limits. And ironically, I know we, we'll talk about Trump soon, but ironically Trump did have a hand in <laughs> the early National Lampoon. Um, that's a, Photoshop, but <laughs> <laughs> the point is there. Um, so Spy Magazine, National Lampoon, really pushing limits, being very uh, anti-establishment, and I think they were coming out of Mad Magazine. As Mad Magazine people grew up, they were moved into doing a slightly more adult National Lampoon, and then moving into Spy Magazine, and they actually did make fun of Trump, and this is where these are, well, I guess they are sort of photoshopped. They're actually probably cut and paste. But these are actual covers where they were attacking Trump. And this is where the legend of his uh, small hands, I think they called him a short-fingered vulgarian. <laughs> <laughs> and they, um, they did it in part. I listened to some of the interviews with, with the people doing Spy Magazine because they knew that it reached Trump. He has a very thin skin, and he would react to it, and he would read these articles and get just infuriated. And he'd even send in uh, copies of his book with his hand circled in gold pen saying, they're normal size. <laughs> and they're like, all right. You know, we, and, and in Spy Magazine at one point, as a parody, they did suggest that Trump run for uh, presidency. And then he did. 
Oh, that's Simpsons who also suggested, which is a you know, weird foreshadowing, like in Spy, Simpsons, um, all these other places. I like that too. The other bit that I noticed as I was putting this together is the paid, um, <laughs> which is another um, kind of you know the paid protesters. And I don't know. That's yeah. Meant they actually did for the rallies. They're paying people to attend the Trump rallies. Well, at least they did at the start. So, but actually, at this time, Trump was still staying um, very classy and continuing to make money. And he didn't start uh, working his Twitter campaign until he was invited on David Letterman. And Letterman said, "Oh, let's do this top ten." And then they tweeted a top, top 10. And the amount of response that uh, Trump got from that and the attention that he got really fed into his ego. And, and he decided, like, hey, this is something I should do. And that's where you really started to see the early tweets. But for the presidency, a lot of people, I don't know, a lot. There's, there's been a few articles about that White House correspondence dinner where Obama just made fun of Trump and his lack of sense of humor as he sat there being made fun of. And I just, one of the cartoons I did is having Trump think, you know, I'm going to get my revenge. And I, I, it's posited that this is where he had the idea of running for president, and it was one of revenge. And I think a lot of his campaign was, was doing that, and that has to do with the birthers and the anything that, and even now that he's in there, a lot of it is to dismantle uh, Obama's legacy. And so, you know, the election happens. He does get, uh, he is welcomed into the White House, and, which was a very surreal event for most of us. <laughs> and at this time, as when, I, you know, I was doing these uh, cartoons, a lot of single panel things, and just doing these kind of very soft, I don't know, um, like, how am I dealing with it? So I have the, you know, don't think of a carrot but don't think of Trump, just trying to be in denial and trying to live my life. Um, election therapy <laughs> bar, which, you know, is another way to deal with it. And then a lot of the things I heard early on is, oh, give them a chance, or, you know, find common ground with the people. And a lot of, you know, it, it, when he was on The Apprentice, it was just something I could never watch. I never liked the, the meanness of it and the, um, just the general tone of it. And so now to be in a position where I'm doing a Trump book is kind of, I don't know if it's my karma that now I'm having to deal with this, but it's, I think all of us are dealing with it in different ways and um, all the cartoonists are, you know, we all are thinking like there's no way that this is going to happen because he just kept putting his foot in his mouth. And this is an American, you know, obviously uh, parody on the Hope. But uh, in Europe, they're a little bit more vicious. And this is basically quoting Trump. But I think, it's, I think the actual translation is a little bit nastier than I want to venture. But it's interesting to see how Europeans um, push harder. I tend to be a lot softer with cartoons. Um, but at, even at the Strand Magazine. Bookstore. Uh, what's that? Bookstore. Bookstore. Stan Bookstar, <laughs> they're, they're making fun of him. So, yeah, doing this book, as uh, my friend told me to do it, so I go out to Trump Tower, walk around, and start drawing these little cartoons of his tweets. And my approach is, is a lot softer. I would take his, he would tweet something like, it's freezing outside, where the hell is global warming? And he puts global warming in quotes. And it's very much a homespun wisdom. Like he's like, it's you and I, dear reader, against these crazy, stupid scientists that are saying these absurd things. And it's it's that familiarity, and it's like I've got the wisdom of the folk hero. And I think that's that's where when I started drawing these tweets, I sort of keyed into that insight where I started to feel like this this is working for me. Um, a lot of them are real prophetic. And this is another one where there's sort of a jealousy of Obama. Now, are you allowed to impeach a president for gross incompetence? And uh, you know, I just imagine Trump writing this, and you know, he's asking for a friend. But again, it has a new relevance as he's now president. On a cheaper side, I tend to always imagine him in the bathroom making these tweets. 
And so, the, you know, I'm not, this is low-hanging fruit, but he's, he's actually, he's advertising, Donald Trump launches new men's fragrance empire at Macy's because every man has his own empire to build. So uh, it's a cheap pun, cheap shot, but you know, whatever. You know, we've got to work through something. So now every time I read a tweet, I imagine him, he eats a lot of fast food, and he, you know, at 4 a.m. he wakes up, runs to the king, and tweets something he's mad about. The United States must greatly strengthen and expand its nuclear capability until such time as the world comes to its senses regarding nukes. And there, how I learned, uh, how I learned to uh, love the bomb and uh, Dr. Strange Love is the natural image for that. And that's, you know, it's like dealing with the fears that we have on Trump is a real, you know, part of the process for me personally doing these cartoons. But his jealousy, like looking at what he's doing and why he did this and where he is now, it's like he wanted to be in the presidency. And you look at a lot of these tweets and you just see his anger. So he tweets about the United Nations where he says it's a great place, um, great potential. But right now, it's just a club for people to get together and have a good time. It's so sad. So he, like, he imagine, like there's this party, and he's just not invited. And that's part of his anger. And that's another one of those insights where I thought, yeah, he just he wants to be the person playing golf. He wants to be the person at the party. He wants to be, you know, have all the things that Clinton had, have all the things that uh, Obama had. And then the other thing is um, we must keep evil out of our country. I, it, this is part of his ideology, where I think that he really truly believes that he is doing something to protect people, or to protect his family, or to protect himself. I think he was bullied as a child, and now he's become a bully. And I think he looks at the world as a hostile place, and his vision of it is one of how to fight against it and defend us against it. And ultimately, you know, I think that these books and these things, they're kind of uh, yeah, difficult to read and a little bit of a pain in the butt, but they do provide legacy. You know, they, they are, like you look back at his past tweets, I think it gives us insight and into what he's doing now. And so keeping track of it as he's deleting ones that are particularly offensive. The only reason President Obama wants to attack Syria is to save face over his very dumb red line statement. Do not attack Syria. And this, what he deleted a day or two before attacking Syria. Um, so that's, that's partly another reason I wanted to do the book is that it is, and that's why we call it the Trump Presidential Library is a way like these are the things that have some meaning that we want to remember and go, yeah, this is hypocritical or this is, what is the real motivation behind it? And now a lot of the, the tweets, which I didn't put in here, but he talks about Russia quite a bit and his sons talked about, yeah, we've got plenty of money coming in from Russia. Um, and I think that a lot of the money trail is going to be his downfall and in terms of being guilt, found guilty for things. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's about it for this. And I would say just try to laugh, um, laugh through the tears. And there's the little book that I put together. And I think now we can welcome Robert for his, give him a big hand. And, uh, <laughs> So I thought I'd give you a little context on my book as well. Also a little bit of history. It seems important to place these things in the context. And certainly all of my work uh, is about parody and about um, appropriation uh, to one degree or another. So I just wanted to show you some of the, um, some, some of where I came from and some of what my influences were. So um, uh, my book is The Uncordable Trump. Um, and it uses all of his uh, spoken words. I didn't want to use tweets. I, some of his tweets feel like advertising to me. I, I was interested in sort of that rambling, semi-incoherent you know, personality that comes out when he speaks. Um, and it's kind of anti-comics because it's not condensed. Uh, and I liked that about it because it was it's sort of taking it somewhere else. Anyway, uh, I do political work every once in a while, but not consistently. This is one of the first things I did. This was from 1992. My brother said, you know, um, Bush and Clinton, who were both running for president, reminded him of Ren and Stimpy. Uh, and I was like, that'd make a great cartoon. Let's not write the dialogue. All the dialogue here is taken from New York Times quotes. So uh, it's, all, it's all verbatim. 
um, just re repackaged. And, and, that, and that's always been kind of my way of working. When I do my own work, it's always working with, with found materials. Um, I have done some stuff for The Daily Show um, with John Stewart a million years ago, it seemed. Um, and I, I, I illustrated a number of uh, um, stories they did um, with Bush as the decider when he declared himself the decider. Um, it was quite fun. I, I would say that's another, I would say that's another um, real uh, important um, influence on a lot of people today. Um, you mentioned Mad and, and Lampoon and Spy. I would say Sure Falls in that as well. I would say The Daily Show, Saturday Night Live. There's lots of places that play with this material. Uh, this was something I did for Mad Magazine when Clinton was running against Obama and uh, Bill would be the superdelegate who was going to make the, make the election work for, for Hillary. It didn't work out that way. Anyway, it's interesting. You can't always predict the future, it turns out. Um, what I wanted to show you also, though, was besides my own work, I wanted to sort of talk about how presidents, real presidents, have appeared in comic book covers. Uh, not just covers, but have appeared in comic books real comic books. So um, certainly, uh, cartoons have run for president, like Richie Rich. I guess he's the president of Mexico? I don't even, I don't know, I haven't read this story. Um, Wonder Woman will be the president a thousand years in the future. It's really not funny anymore. Um, but beyond characters running for president, the presidents themselves became characters. Um, uh, Eisenhower showed up in this science fiction story published uh, in Mystery in Space in the mid-50s. These aliens can't believe this crazy world where someone named Eisenhower could be in charge. Um, um, and when, when Marvel was doing superhero comics, the president started showing up pretty frequently. It's interesting. This is in an early um, Fantastic Four comic. They're very discreet about showing Kennedy. I don't know if that's out of respect or they're just being cheeky about it. But um, they would only show his forehead and his hair and his rocking chair, which is enough to sort of give you the sense of who it was. Superman, on the other hand, is, is buds with, with JFK. Uh, and they hang out. Uh, Kennedy figured out uh, Superman's secret identity. Uh, and they, they palled around a little bit. Um, so that's also an interesting, interesting side note. Um, I knew I wasn't risking my secret identity with you, if you can't trust the President of the United States, who can you trust? Oh, Superman, so naive. Go back to Krypton, you immigrant. So I know it's horrible. I'm sorry. I apologize to Superman um, and all of Metropolis. Um, it seemed that as the 60s went on, Marvel got more and more comfortable showing the heroes. So this is an episode, uh, rather, um, uh, a, 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 um, an issue of uh, the Tales to Astonish with the Hulk, and, and um, here LBJ shows up. Um, and, and, and the president seemed to get a lot involved in Hulk matters. For some reason, he seems to be uh, the, the one who pulls them in. I guess he's the national threat. Um, uh, remember that story I showed you a few um, uh, panels ago? Uh, it was reprinted by DC in the 70s, so they replaced Nixon. So now it's the same story, but they've like glued, they've, uh, glued in a, a shot of Nixon instead. Um, now this is a bizarre one. This is from the late 60s. Uh, I don't know if you've read every issue of Richie Rich, but he meets a guy named Uriah Heep, who looks strangely like the President of the United States, and he's a crook. This is 1968. He's going after he's going after Richie Rich for his money. So I'm not, not the President, but just looks just like him. Um, Nixon showed up a lot. Uh, in, in Marvel Comics in the 70s. Uh, here he is giving really bad advice to the Fantastic Four. And here he is again trying to give bad advice to the Fantastic Four. <laughs> and here he is fighting the Hulk. Many foes have the Hulk. One of the foes is Nixon. Uh, he's like, oh, um, it sounds insane. He's telling the general, it sounds insane, but I've got faith in you about the way you're going to attack the Hulk. It doesn't work out. It never works out with Nixon. Um, this is the craziest Nixon appearance. Although he's never named, he's in shadow. Captain America is, is fighting this, this uh, shrouded evil, uh, this evil cabal. And it turns out, when they run into the White House, Captain America takes off his hood. And he says, high, off, high political office didn't satisfy me. My power was still too constrained by legalities. And he blows his brains out. And, and Captain America has a crisis of faith. Um, so 
he's never named, but uh, the author of this story, Steve Englehart, said, yeah, it's Nixon. Who, who, who'd you think it was? Who'd you think it was? Uh, where's Ford? Where's Cheryl Ford? I guess not in office long enough. Not much, not much Ford in the comics. I'm sure I've missed something. This is a very quick uh, uh, look through the years. But Carter, Carter showed up a few times. He's in the bottom right-hand corner watching Muhammad Ali and Superman. This cover makes total sense. It all, it all fits together. Of course Carter would be there. Why wouldn't he be there in space watching them fight under a green sun so that Superman, red sun, so Superman loses his powers. It's totally logical. Um, and of course, Howard the Duck ran for president against Carter. Carter yells foul. You see in the bottom corner. Um, so these things happen. Uh, so Carter got a little play. Uh, Reagan got a lot of play, a lot of play. He's constantly telling Superman, oh, you can't use your powers that way. He's constantly bossing Superman around. And Superman takes it for some reason. I don't understand. But uh, he outlaws superheroes in the story. Superman's very upset. Uh, I don't blame him. Uh, and then, of course, in The Dark Knight, just a few years later, set in the future, um, a, a president who's unnamed but is essentially Reagan is also bossing Superman around and making him uh, take on Batman. It doesn't go well. Don't, don't take on Batman. Um, this is an interesting one. It's, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't point the finger at Reagan, but Reagan becomes a mutated lizard monster <laughs> because the water in Washington, D.C. has been poisoned, um, not just because of the swamp, because of a bad guy. Uh, so uh, Captain America has to make Reagan sweat the toxin out by beating the crap out of him over multiple pages. But he returns to himself. And uh, all's well. He's still got the sharp fangs at the end of the story, though. So watch out for Nick, uh, I'm sorry, Reagan, Nixon, Ron. They're all the same. No, they're not all the same. That's the problem. No Bush Sr. I couldn't find any good Bush Sr. Uh, appearances. But um, when Superman died, spoiler alert, Superman died in 1993, uh, all the superheroes came to his funeral. And Bill and Hillary gave a eulogy. Hillary got to be part of the eulogy, which, is, which says something about Hillary's uh, potency, even in the 90s. Um, so um, moving a few years forward, Civil War, Marvel had a big fight. You might have heard about it. Uh, again, just like a Republican, uh, George W. Bush is making deals with Tony Stark to like take all the civil liberties away from uh, superheroes. Tisk, tisk, tisk. It all worked out. Everybody's OK now. Um, I have to say, I have to give a special shout out to the Savage Dragon constantly putting uh, Bush on the cover. This is a, an alien replica of Bush, but he's still punching him on the cover of the magazine, so that's nice. Um, I don't remember the circumstances of this, but even Carrie gets a little cameo in this one. Um, and then in 2008, uh, Savage Dragon uh, um, throws the support behind Barack Obama, so good for Savage Dragon. They're both from Chicago. I think that's the. I think that's what links them. Um, and Spider-Man, of course. I don't know if they met. I think it's just the cover. Did they actually meet in the story? Has anyone read the story? They met. Okay, good. Because I've only seen the cover. Sorry. Uh, I should read it. Learn my history. Um, and uh, I just before I get into my own stuff, I just wanted to mention there have been a ton of parodies of presidents in comic books. I'm just going to point out a few. This is one of the earliest ones. This was like a, a, a self-published, small publisher uh, magazine that came out in 65, I believe. LBJ is a superhero uh, fighting the Klan. It's actually milder than it looks, but I give him credit for throwing the Klan in there. Turns out the Klan are bad people, you know. Who knows anymore? I can't, no one can agree, it seems. Um, Bob Mann and Kennedy. Uh, I suppose if, I suppose if, uh, if uh, Bob had won, then uh, there'd be more of these comic books. But they, look at that. They meet, they meet all the other, all the other uh, um, famous people, including Ronald Reagan. So this is also from the late 60s, of course. Half parodic, half serious. These aren't the most exciting parodies, but it's interesting that they exist. Uh, this is one of my favorites from Robert Smigel and Adam McKay. This is The Ex-Presidents, originally on SNL, but uh, also a comic book. I was excited that uh, that, uh, that lasted. Um, so uh, there's plenty more of this stuff. One of the things that really uh, inspired, I guess inspired is the word, it's hard to say, um, was this series. This, this is a little dicey, but I'm going to show it to you. So, um, 
you know, clutch your, clutch your chests. There was a series of comics called Tea Party Comics that came out in 2010, I think it was. And you can find them at Ethan Prusoff's website. Ethan is not the artist, but he sort of catalogs oddball political uh, comics. So these are black and white zines put out by someone, and they're really crudely drawn. Um, but they take old comic book covers and insert Barack Obama. They don't use quotes from Barack, but they, but they put him in things. And it's clearly anti-Barack. Um, I'm sorry, anti-President Obama. Um, but it's kind of fascinating. And the drawing is so crude, people were really appalled by these. But I think it's just punk folk art. Uh, so even though I completely disagree with them, I was intrigued because he's really taking, it, taking the cues off of comics history, which is what I usually do in my work. Um, so just a, just a little backstory here. We had an election last year. I don't know if you heard about it. Um, but um, three days before the election, I was so sick of hearing Donald Trump speak. Um, I, I tweeted this. I said, had a great idea to do a mini comic using Trump quotes drawn in the style of Tea Party comics, see photo. Would someone do it for me? I did not want to think about this guy anymore. And I thought, in five days, he's, you know, he's going to be back in New York. And people I know will be throwing garbage at him every day for all the terrible things he said for two years. And it'll all be over. And then, and then something else happened. Um, and so when he, when he won on a te technicality, I thought, all right, I have to do the book. So I put out a little zine, a little uh, black and white zine, kind of in the style of Tea Party uh, comics. But um, instead of, of course, um, uh, you know, having, having it um, uh, um, pro-Trump, uh, it's anti-Trump. So all of the quotes are things that he said during the campaign. Uh, I was just trying to catalog things. And I kind of wanted to just put something on the world that said, not all Americans like this man. I really felt I felt like uh, I felt like I needed to say something. My vote certainly didn't count, so um, <laughs> I made this mini comic. Um, I think the one on the right is my favorite one. Uh, such a nasty woman. Uh, so I wanted to take all of the comics I loved and all the comics that I've played with as as source material for my work and really um, kind of infect them with this disease that was um, destroying our country. Uh, anyway, I was really pleased that people liked this because I thought. I honestly thought people would just be furious at me for like calling more attention to himself because he he does he is a black hole in that he just sucks everything in and it's, it's um I'm very torn about the existence of this mini um, but then drawn in quarterly my publisher said do you want to expand it into a book so we made a bigger book I thought well we're giving part of the profits to the uh, ACLU and um, I felt like all right maybe this would um, make the afflicted feel like someone agreed with them. So here's some of the covers. I'm not going to read them all now, but they're all, they're all um, from the campaign and beyond. I didn't want to choose stuff he said before. I only wanted to focus on the, on the things that he said intentionally while running for president, and then things he said while he was president, which I just found outrageous. Um, I've had a, an interesting response to this book. Some people have really responded to it, even as fans of Trump. And I, there's so many things about him I don't understand. Um, I thought this was kind of clearly not pro-Trump, but um, people, have, uh, people have read into it the way they read into everything surrounding him. Um, so it's been an interesting, it's been an interesting, uh, it's been an interesting project. So um, what I thought we'd do now is, um, I thought we'd bring Shannon back up, we'd take some questions, and um, if you have any answers, we'd love to hear them. Uh, so thanks very much. I'm going to put uh, some of the images on a loop, and we can let that play while we talk. I guess we can just take seats. So thank you very much. Let me just get this going. Oh, here we go. Great. Perfect. All right. Awesome. So these, will, these should cycle through. So any questions? Hi, everyone. Uh, it would seem very clear to me that uh, they drum a hair on Nixon in the same way as uh, Harry Osborne, the Green Goblin. And so my, my question was, which came first, if you knew? Um, well, Harry Osborne is from the mid-60s. Yeah. So Nixon was already vice president. You'd have to ask Steve Ditko. Yeah, because the same way he's not was, talking. With the weird, with the weird you know, sideways right. corners. You're also, right. Uh, in that first image summer, Wildcats uh, had a series where uh, 
the Daemonites or aliens were living inside various humans. And there was definitely a clear shot of, oh my god, they're even in that guy, and it was Dan Quayle. So, uh, <laughs> okay. King Bush, Bush Senior, there were definite Quayle. In the yeah, I, that's he, one of the first like, two issues of Wildcats. I'm, I'm going to write that down. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's great. Good. That's great. Yeah. Any other Dan Quayle sightings? <laughs> we don't have to talk about Dan Quayle anymore. Uh, anyone else? So, I, this is for you primarily, Shannon. When it comes to Can we give you a mic? Oh, right. We're going to repeat the question. Too, but. Right. Now that I stood up. Yeah, so when it comes to political cartooning, like obviously, obviously there are certain things you wouldn't be able to put into a newspaper. But like, at it, are your political cartoons sort of protected by that by the freedom of the press sort of ideal, or how does that? play into it. Yeah, I did actually talk to a lawyer as I started this, because I was a little bit worried. I, yeah, basically, I'm I'm the artist, and for both of us, and Trump is the writer, and which is an odd, we're sharing credit in a way. I'm not, yeah, I'd be happy to send him a check, actually. It's, it'd be really funny to see if he endorsed it and sent it back. Supposedly, he would, there's a, the person that did the short-fingered Vulgarian um, I mean, he sent Trump a check for something like a royalty or something for two dollars and sixty-three cents, and Trump actually cashed it and <laughs> for the gold pen. <laughs> I don't know what. Um, yeah, supposedly I'll, I'm protected, but that you know, I don't know if it, it it'll be a mixed bag if he comes after me. I mean, right now he has bigger fish to fry. After. <laughs> but it'll be a it'll be a nightmare. I mean, like it will definitely be a nightmare. But book sales will go through the roof. So it, it'll be a mixed bag. But you'll earn every penny you make in I, a situation like I that. I can't emphasize enough. You have to do your work, and this is protected speech. This is not. I mean, some newspapers might not want to publish specific things. It might be out of the bounds of them, out of the bounds of what they can publish. But if you can get stuff out into the world, I've been doing parodies for 30 years. I've never had serious trouble. I've had like a couple of cease and desist letters, but I've never had any, never had any legal action on me. Um, it's super important to not be afraid of, of, of working with this stuff. He's a public figure. I'm not a lawyer. I could be wrong about a lot of stuff, but he's, not, he, but, um, he's a public figure. Yeah. He's uh, all of the all of the things he said are publicly made public, disseminated, dis publicly disseminated. And I'm assuming the lawyer said you were. Yeah, clear. They said lawyers want clear. to be careful. Yeah, but um, that's not our job to be careful. Yeah. And then I, you know, it was actually Charles Brownstein is, is my friend who told me that he's like, oh, illustrate Trump's tweets. He's the one that told me to do it, and he's running the comic book legal defense fund. So <laughs> when. Something hits the fan. I'm, hey, remember how you like? It's now's the time to get me out of jail. It's, he uh, will. He will. Yeah. They're a good organization. <laughs> I, I honestly think, though, that this is protected. It, it's protected, and I mean, there's a number. For now. There's a number of, of of quotes that I used of him talking about, like, I, we're gonna change the libel laws to keep people from saying slanderous things about us, and you can't let that. Man, yeah, it's important to be fearless. I mean, at some yeah. point, you just have to. I mean, and you're and you are protected. I mean, I, I I've not had any problems, and I have been doing this. Not gonna work when you say that, man. It's, you're just tempting. Fate. I just I think it's important. And actually, uh, I was on a panel with Ron English, and he said, especially when you're young, you should push the boundaries before you get a family. I don't have a family. If you, if, you, if, you, if you know, before you have a family or before you have like a lot of responsibilities, like it's like push the boundaries while you can um, because they're actually more malleable than yeah. you think. So it's, you know, I, I don't want you to go get into trouble. And I'm not a lawyer. I do. But I, <laughs> go for it. But I, you, but I do want you to, I do want you to feel that you can, that you can. Um, and that you, you, know, you do get in trouble. Like, there's your next book. Is like how I went to jail over this comic, and then you've had another year of living. You know, being uh, If we assume that Trump is the world's biggest troll, yeah. and more kind of work, a bit like feeding him, stronger. Yes. Bad. The question was, since if if you think of Trump as a troll, if you think Trump is a troll, then aren't we just feeding the troll essentially? 
Yeah, and that's yeah. I think I think we are, and, and like when the Apprentice is on, I, I just refuse to watch it because I, I thought it was a really bad energy, not to be a free free hippie, but I thought it was bad energy, and I didn't want to you know endorse it in any way, even by just absorbing it on at the gym and on the treadmill and like flipping. It's like I don't even watch anything but that, and. Um, yeah, and then now doing the book even, I feel a little bit like it inadvertently is endorsing something. So, I don't know. I mean, can you make an anti-war film? I don't know if you can. Somebody said you, that's impossible. But I'm trying to do... I don't know. I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying to understand him more than anything else, really. It's like, what is going on underneath? You know, maybe it's not much. Maybe it's a... Wizard of Oz put up beside the curtain and there's a little tiny man. Uh, I, yeah, mixed feelings. Um, hey. Uh, can I, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. No, sorry. I'm in a wheelchair, so I'm practically the invisible uh, one up here. Oh, but, I go for it. We, you have the microphone, though. That's uh, <laughs> it. Okay, you go and we'll be there. still yeah. funny. But, um, So one thing that's really struck me with this election is how many, kind of how low, like you said, you have people who are pro-Trump, yes. who seem to be attracted to it, not as a parody, like how they want to see them. Yeah. And I'm coming, part of me trying to understand the election, I, I, t I see conversations with stuff like, that seems totally kind of non-really negotiable, like what Stephen Colbert does. Mm -hmm. And then you talk to people and they're like, oh no, he's really awesome. Like taking him very literally. So I was wondering. I'm sorry, who, who's really awesome? I missed that last part. Oh, Stephen Colbert. Like some people don't take that as, as a parody. character. Like, that he like, like they find him yeah. straight up. His original, you mean his, on his original show? Yes. I, yeah, I guess that's gotten kind of convoluted at this point. No, it's okay, it's okay. I in, just wanted in, to... in the age of Trump. But Stephen Colbert, the Comedy Central character right, right. of the Colbert Report. Right, right, right. So, how do you feel as an artist when people don't take this as parody? And if your art could be used to promote Trump as well. That's what uh, my uh, editorial cartoonist friends, a couple of them came down on me for drawing him as cute, and I'm saying that it's, their art has been used and transformed into being a thing that they didn't believe in, like the pro-segregation or um, anti-immigration or pro-Trump, and they said this is what, the, by you doing your book this way, this is gonna happen to you. And I, I listen to that, and yeah, it is a worry. And I, there's not, control is very much an illusion. And it would be nice to say, hey, this is what's going to happen. You just keep an eye out, and you send an email and say, hey, you know, I don't want you to do this. You use my work in this way. Most people, if you approach them reasonably, respond reasonably, is what I've found. And even emailing people that you think, oh, this person is off the rails, so, you know, you. When I have seen it, it's happened once so far, and I emailed them, and it was just not, and I was like, no, I'd really rather you not do this. It, it's not, you know, it's not what I wanted. And they're like, oh, okay, no problem. It was very rational. Um, yeah, it's a dice roll. I don't, I don't know. Would it well, it's, it's, so, it's so interesting. I mean, any work that you make is likely to be understood or not understood. Um, I, I tried to make it clear where I was coming from, um, but people, I mean, every, every book is a Rorschach for someone. So the way they read it is always, um, is always out of your hands. And I don't mean that as a way of like getting out of responsibility for it. I, I think more than a lot of my other work, this is more pointed and more um, subjective and my subjectivity. Um, but um, but I, I, don't under, I don't actually know, I don't quite understand the reality we're living in now either, so maybe <laughs> I'm being too cavalier about it. But so much of my work relies on pastiche and appropriation that I can only, I, 
it's inevitable, the culture we live in, things get mutated and, and reused in ways we don't like. Um, I, people who, who hate Trump as much as me have responded positively to this work, and I can only assume that um, they get it, and I, I, can, I can only sort of be responsible for what I feel like I need to do in the moment. Uh, I really wanted to say, hey, this guy is insane. Um, <laughs> how people take that, I don't know. I mean, I, it's, it's really tough. That's a really fascinating and big question. And I thought Colbert was amazing and horrifying on his old show. <laughs> um, so I mean, I, I felt like I got where he was coming from. But, but yeah, I guess, um, yeah. I don't mean to like co-opt the end of this question that much, but I highly recommend, there is this coloring book that came out about Trump, I'd say like sometime past the midterms, but before the general became a surrealist painting um, somewhere in there. Um, but it was very much in the style of comics. Mm -hmm. And I just, uh, Trump as kind of a very, I would say, neutral superhero. Um, and I, I was convinced when I saw this that this was not pro-Trump. And, and it had his quotes in the wrong direction. And I opened up, and it's, it is his point of view. Like, he's totally pro-Trump, completely. Right. This was in the middle of Barnes & Noble, in their front thing. So, I mean, as someone who's seen comics in a certain style, things just seem more ambiguous, and I just right. thought yeah. you would find no, it's to, find to look at that. I, I might have seen that. I mean, it is interesting. I think some people try to sort of play it on the edge, so it's like, if you don't like it, maybe you'll buy this. But that wasn't my intention at all. Oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but that's, I mean, that's I, that's I think good. I've seen this. I'm sorry. Yes. Question? Oh, yes. Um, I was wondering, um, it's, it seems to me like the cartooning, especially of Trump, is in a kind of problematic position. And I wonder if you could compare it to the Nixon moment, where <laughs> it was very clear what cartoonists were doing. And, um, you know, even, you know, uh, artists dealing dealing with, um, with him. And why, why it is so different is it, you know, because Nixon had these great features and it was so easy, or what made it less problematic? I, uh, yeah, I think, uh, did you, uh, I was in that uh, earlier yeah. today and it was a similar question. started to leave and then because of the question, I guess. It's a good question. It's, a, it's a, politically like cartooning making fun of Nixon versus cartooning making fun of Trump. I, you know, I, because I was sitting in the back watching and I was thinking, you know, right now, I think we live in a very uptight culture where, and that's one reason I wanted to show, like, the Charlie Hebdo, because they're, I think, pretty fearless. I don't agree with a lot of their politics and how they approach humor, but they're fearless in this, and I look at the street fairs that they have in Europe and, and the way they went after Nixon, and would they say that uh, English cartoonists love to draw poop? And then they're always drawing poop and, and but American cartoonists, yeah, we're just softer and but right now we are very uptight, I think, culturally, and it's an interesting time because of that. Um, but do you think it's just the time or I think it's a time. I, I think it's absolutely the time because Trump is outrageous and he should be buried. And you look at some of the things that came out like that nude statue of him with his micro penis. Which is, you know, I, and I felt bad for laughing at it because I thought, okay, this is sort of body shaming in a way that I don't really like. But that's me being uptight again because it was funny as hell. Um, and in Europe, where they just draw him, you know, raping the Statue of Liberty, and this is like going down the street at a street fair as this giant statue, and everybody's like, woo! You know, it's, and if we did something like that, it would be like there's a kid burning a hat, and we're like, oh my god, like, yeah, that's nothing compared to uh, the European. We're uptight. I think that's just that the time we're in right now. I, I, I do think that because he is right for parody. But I think he I think he has a certain Teflon quality because he is more outrageous. It's I I, I don't know, and I, I never having drawn Nixon when he was president. <laughs> uh, it seems that Trump uh, can somehow absorb the resistance to him in a way that Nixon was never able to. The do. tiny hands though that's stuck and that really pisses him off. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fine, Wait, who is it? Somebody else up front had another question. You got one? Because I was trying to. Oh, no, okay. Sorry, person that left. Yes? Um, I tend to keep my finger on the pulse of stuff like that within the political sphere. I, I have to admit, though, after the election, I sort of I, I felt really blindsided. So I'm curious to know um, what, what you just looking at, like, something that was potentially entertaining when you were making these products, or was there sort of a certain level of clairvoyance involved? Like, were you thinking, hmm, this could not play out the way that some people want it to? Does that make sense? No, phrase again. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I guess it wasn't anything that I was expecting. To yeah. Remember. No, I think most of us were blindsided. I think all of us. I mean, so I, I think, like, oh, yeah. So I guess my question is, is when these were done, were you, were, were you kind of thinking like, hey, this might not go the way a lot of people are expecting? In terms of the election. No, not at all. I didn't start drawing mine until after the election. Yeah. Um, I, I was so furious, I just drew them out of fury. Uh, people <laughs> ask me what I think is going to happen. It's like, I didn't know what was going to happen before. Why would I know what's going to happen now? This was strictly, it, it, it began as just a total reaction. Total reaction. Yeah. And, yeah. And, yeah. and also, again, like I said, to just sort of say, I disagree. Like, I wanted to sort of state that at the beginning of the before he even got into office. I was just like, I just wanted to point out this is a terrible thing that this country, that's happening to this country or we did to this country. So um, yeah. I don't have any clairvoyance on this. I usually adapt classic literature, so I like to have more distance <laughs> between what I do. Like, um, I've adapt I've I'm working on an adaptation of Herman Melville. There's some good distance between me and Herman. Um, to work with someone who's alive and screaming in my ear uh, is really difficult for me to have any perspective on what I'm doing, other than I'm angry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and, and for me, same thing. It's like I was looking at my own work, putting together a new book, and I was just bored by myself. Just like, ugh, you know, I just don't want to look at this crap. And there was so much going on around it. I thought I, I wanted to do something that was actually real and, and talking about something real. And so, in part, I wanted to understand what, ha what had happened, and I, I was befuddled, and like, it's a way mentally for me to try to, I, and I think that's why there's a lot of Trump literature coming out, and there's a lot of obsession with him, is because we're trying to make sense of something, and I do think he's a bit of a madman, and putting the rationality onto a madman is, you know, it, is gonna drive us all insane, but that's what we're trying trying to do. And the part, like with the talk, like I wanted to show this is a little bit what cartoonists do, is we sit in the back of the class and do silly drawings of our teachers. And that's just an instinct that we have, I think. Yeah, let's see. Let, oh. some guys at the mic who've been waiting. Oh, yeah. And if, if I'm, if I, yeah, if we're not being in order, then yeah. Who's, who's next if we get, who's at the mic that is waiting? Oh, yeah, I was pointing at him. That was good. That was good. I was on it. Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, thanks both of you. Um, I'm an artist myself, and I, uh, I've done one Trump drawing now, um, only because I had another friend who was doing a, a ton of them and very effectively satir satirizing him, and um, I couldn't bring myself to do it. I've heard both of you say like the amount of revulsion and just uh, unparalleled fury and just a lot of like negative emotions that have been brought on by all this. And I'm just curious, how do you... Uh, like, is there like anything that you would say about what you do to make it feel okay? Like, do you do you like sit and meditate? Do you like dunk your head in a bucket full of chamomile? Like, what do you do? Because for me, I, the one drawing was all I could do, and I, I have so much respect for you guys and my friend that does the same stuff. I just don't know how I couldn't do it. Yeah, everybody's different, and we're all processing differently. Um, I and mean, yeah, I don't think that that's. Yeah, I didn't think I was going to be drawing Trump. I had no interest in him. I don't know if you're speaking of Warren Craighead, but he's someone who has another book out called Trump, Trump. And every day he's been doing a drawing based on something he said or tweeted, I think. Um, and every day he does a drawing of Trump. And they're really, they're really grotesque and, <laughs> and angry. And he feels he needs to do it because he started and he feels like he needs to see the administration through. Hopefully it will be over sooner. Two years or eight years. So anyway, um, so he's someone who's continued. For me, it was like 
finishing this book was this is this is I it I sort of hate leaving the story hanging, but I feel like I've actually summarized in these 48 pages most of his opinions. Like I don't think he's going to do anything surprising, you know, beyond like leaving office. Again, don't say that you are tempting fate. Like every no, I'm just saying that I'm saying all the stuff he says is reflected in these: his opinions about the military, his opinions about immigrants, his opinions about women. It's like I feel like all the sort of topics, the cavalcade of topics he discusses, kind of being talked. So as far as as far as how to deal with it, I think you were right to get out <laughs> after one drawing. <laughs> I hope it was a hell of a drawing, and I hope people, uh, I hope people, uh, you know, appreciate it. Um, but um, you know, you can only you can only stare at this for so long. <laughs> we have another question. Sorry, I've got no bigger solutions. Where's the next? Did somebody else have a question? Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. I talk to friends in third world countries, and they laugh at me and say, ah, this is your first dictator. It's not a big deal. <laughs> You'll get through it. You know, it'll get better. It'll get worse. It's, and they laugh at me. It's like, <laughs> I like that. I mean, it's, not, it's a Anyone who's, I, I think you're right. I think anyone who's compelled to make this work, you should make the work. I mean, I, I would not just... Yeah, and be fearless about it, but too. But if you're, like, if you're, not, if you're not feeling it, don't make yourself... Don't give yourself an illness drawing him, is what I'm saying. <laughs> if there's other ways of dealing with it, though, I mean, absolutely. Um, I, I was in two of the issues of Resist that Francoise Mouly has put out with Nadja uh, Spiegelman, her daughter. They've been c compiling a lot of cartoons of the Resistance, and that's great, and there's other places... Uh, um, there's other magazines that make an effort to cover this stuff. And if you are compelled to make it, there are places, there are like-minded people who will appreciate it. So um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't discourage you. But if you can't face it anymore, like, don't, like I say, don't give yourself, don't give yourself agita. Um, <laughs> but it is important. I, I was wondering, you, you were saying that there's this kind of timidity now. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering whether what happened to Charlie Hebdo, you think, contributed to that or um, no. not? No. no, I think it's our culture. I think we just shifted into kind of a Victorian era where we're uptight about a lot of things. And some of it's coming out of very well-intentioned um, sensitivity to people, and some of it is just control mechanisms on, on ideology, ways to control people that I don't like or agree with. Um, but I think, yeah. And you don't think it's fear of reprisal by Trump? Because no, no. <laughs> He's not gonna see this. <laughs> I mean, I think we're also we're also a fearful um, we're also a fearful country. Like like whenever I would, and this was like five or ten years ago. Oh, no, it was more than that. But we were trying to promote a comic, so we we shot it with a gun, and then we had the stories and some like relate to the bullet hole. But immediately when we were doing that, you know, there's, there's four of us all these ideas on why we shouldn't do that. And it had to do with somebody else will copy us and then shoot themselves and we'll get sued. The retailers will um, think that the book is damaged and they'll sue us. Um, that they'll, I, it was just like, just dumb, but a lot of it came down to lawsuits and I don't know why it's the litigi litigious nature of, of are thinking, but there's a lot of fear that we have that's been kind of seeded and has kind of made us, I think, yeah, just fearful in a way that's kind of weird. And we just have to get over some of that fear of like, oh, don't draw that because you'll be this, or don't do this because, no, I mean, like the, the you know, the, the um, Charlie stuff, like that, they're back at it. I mean, those, they are an inspiration in terms of free speech. I think. And I don't, like I said, I don't really like a lot of what they do, but man, they are, it's more power to them for doing it. <laughs> yeah. And I think we're going to end a little bit early because we, you have your books here too, right? Do you bring some uh, books up? No, I just have this one. Uh, <sighs> you, you're welcome. No, you should buy stuff. Then we're not going to end early. We'll, if we have more questions, we'll, we'll end. We're on time. Okay.
And then also I, I did bring some posters, um, some too much Kofefe man posters, <laughs> which I fully pulled from him. I, I was like, oh, this is this fits. Yes, I totally stole um, his ideas. I would say one last thing is um, uh, we. Uh, you know, it's funny because we're talking about like the culture is suppressed. It's like Trump has unleashed so much of the wrong energy. <laughs> this is like the last time to not um, let only the white supremacists feel emboldened. So, you know, I, you know, I, I, uh, I'm not, I, I really try to stay out of politics and I, this stuff winds me up so fast, but I feel like we are in extraordinarily terrible times. So uh, I hope people will be brave about um, resisting. And we'll get through it.